So I read Stolen Tongues by Felix Blackwell earlier this month and I had a lot of thoughts and I, I wanted to make a video for it and I started scripting out like a more formal, structured script for a video and I just couldn't finish it. I'm in the middle of a cross-country move right now and I had just accepted that I wasn't going to be posting any videos until the new year. I actually have like a two-hour video that is fully filmed and almost fully edited. It's the first in my series of reading every Maggie Steve Otter young adult novel and I just I can't finish editing it. I just I don't really have the time or the energy and so I just had accepted that that would be a project for the new year. But this book, Stolen Tongues, it just raised a lot of thoughts for me that I kind of wanted to have a conversation about. And so, like I said, I, I started with that formal, more structured script. I couldn't get it done. I then started filming a slightly more informal video where I was just kind of going through bullet points. And midway through filming that, I spilled an entire mug of coffee on my laptop. <laughs> and I, uh, my laptop is okay. I had to take care of it, obviously. And I technically could have just hopped back in and finished filming that video, but I just, something about that just really made me lose steam and like, it took the wind from my sails. And so now what we're doing, I am sitting at my desk. Um, there's nothing really fancy about the setup. I'm actually using my phone to film this. It's a, it's a pretty good camera quality, I think, but I've never filmed on my phone, so I don't know how it's gonna look like uh, editing wise. But I, I'm just gonna go, I'm lowering the standards for myself. And I just kind of wanna talk about some of the thoughts that I had. Um, specifically, Stolen Tongues has been criticized for its representation of native peoples and native culture culture feels honestly like too generous of a word but um it's been criticized for its its native representation and of course in the u.s it's native american heritage month so it's just kind of a a fitting time to be talking about it i mean it's always a good time to talk about uh, native literature and native representation in literature but it feels like the right time so i'm filming this in november i don't know if it'll get posted in november because we're nearing the end of the month but yeah i just i just wanted to talk about it so i am a citizen of a tribal nation in california and my work, in my job, I work with Native tribes and organizations to empower sovereign decision making. Um, I work with groups across the U.S. and have worked with tribes in Colorado, which is where Stolen Tongues is set. But to be clear, the only perspective I represent is my own. <laughs> I don't claim to speak for anyone else, and certainly other Native readers and individuals have had lots of opinions on this book. So my purpose here is just to share some of my thoughts and have a conversation. I kind of hope, I mean, I don't know if he'll see this. I'm a very small channel, but I would love to hear other people's thoughts and opinions, questions, whether you're native or non-native. I think it's just, it, it's nice to talk about these things with each other. So um, I'll read a blurb of what Stolen Tongues is. I'm not going to spend a ton of time explaining the plot because I want to talk about more like high level stuff. Honestly, that's, that's where my energy is, I suppose. But um, the blurb on Goodreads, I have my computers over here, so I'm gonna be looking over here. Uh, a romantic cabin getaway doesn't go exactly as planned. High up on the windswept, windswept cliffs of Pale Peak, Faye and Felix celebrate their new engagement. But soon a chorus of ghastly noises erupts from nearby. The screams of animals, the cries of children, and the mad babble of a hundred mournful voices. A dark figure looms near the windows in the dead of night, whispering to Faye. As the weather turns deadly, Felix discovered that his terrified fiance isn't just mumbling in her sleep, she's whispering back. This book has a pretty interesting background, so I'm going to read um, earlier this month, at the beginning of November, the author published, not published, sorry, um, posted some thoughts on a Reddit thread called r slash horror lit. He was just kind of reflecting on um, this novel and his choice to write a prequel for it, some of the criticism he's received, and I'm going to read part of that statement now, and then part of it, I think, later. But let's just start with the background. So he says, Stolen Tongues is vastly more popular than any of my other works, and it is also vastly lower in quality. It was never meant to be a novel and was certainly never intended for mass public consumption. It quite literally was just a dinky Reddit post on r slash no sleep and not even a planned one at that. The story goes that I was in graduate school and I made a major error on a project. My advisor asked me to redo the whole thing. I felt really stupid and went home and basically just quit working for that day. I thought about dropping out. I doom scrolled Reddit for a while and came across r slash no sleep, read a few stories, and wondered if anyone would find my own idea interesting. I came up with it on the spot after remembering that my partner often talked in her sleep. There was a moment during writing the post when a friend in my cohort texted me and asked if I wanted to go grab lunch. He knew I was upset and I almost accepted, but I decided to stay home. If I had gone with him, I'd have closed Reddit and not finished the post, 
and my life would be completely different than it is today. The post was just a loose collection of ideas. Partner and I visit cabin. We hear weird, impossible noises. It snows. That was it. I went to bed that night, and when I woke up, the post was on the front page of Reddit. I had hundreds of people messaging me, slash leaving comments, asking for an update. So I wrote one, and then another, and another, and the thing just kept going. Every single post I made blew up way out of control. Each morning, I had no idea where the story was going next. When it was over, I had people bugging me to turn it into a physical book so they could keep it. I taught myself how to use KDP, or whatever it was called back then, and published the story, slightly rewritten and expanded. But I was a dead broke grad student. I could not afford an editor. I had no experience or training as a fiction author. I did not even know what character development and story arc were. I had zero clue how to plot or pace a novel. I had zero clue how to write any characters except a scared male everyman with barely any personality at all. I sure as shit didn't know how to write a good ending. I never marketed the book. All I did was make a post on No Sleep telling people it was available in physical format. I thought maybe a hundred people would buy it as a fun keepsake from the interactive role play of that storytelling format. But the thing went viral, first in India for some reason, then in Vietnam, then in the US, and it kept going viral. Like every year, some major reviewer would pick it up and I'd wake up to an exploded email inbox. I'll just be jogging on the treadmill at the gym and my phone will light up with 140 emails from people telling me a popular YouTuber just mentioned it. I don't know if I already said this, but this was published in 2017, so it's been seven years, almost eight. Oh my gosh, <laughs> it's almost 2025. Um, it has, let's see, 41,000 ratings and almost 7,000 reviews on Goodreads. That's a lot, right? So I'm not talking about like some dinky little self-published book that has barely reached anyone. This book is quite popular. It gets recommended to people uh, on like, you know, top 10 horror reads or like the scariest things I've ever read. It gets recommended a lot on lists and just like peer to peer. So it has been kind of a phenomenon in its own right. Now the story, if I had to like really condense it, basically goes like this. Felix and Faye are engaged. They go to the mountains of Colorado to Faye's family cabin to have a romantic getaway. While they're there, they start hearing scary noises in the woods. At night, it sounds like someone is walking around their cabin. There's a, a creepy dream catcher in the woods outside of their cabin made of like sinew and bone and blood. Um, we'll just put a pin in that for later. <laughs> and Faye has always been, she's always had night terrors. She's always talked in her sleep. And I think she's always slept walked too. Sleep, sleep walked, slept, sleep, not slept walked sleepwalked. She's always done that. <laughs> but while they're at the cabin, Felix realizes that the thing that's outside, because that, the, there's not just like animal noises, they're, they're hearing voices and some of them even sound like their loved ones. And Faye is talking back to it in her sleep. So she's like answering questions and stuff. And they begin to feel like they're being lured into the woods. So they get off the mountain, they're very scared. They go back home, but even when they return home, Faye is acting strange, and they realize that um, she her engagement ring is gone. She's like, it, it's meant to be scary, and I, I guess it kind of is, but it's honestly a little bit comedic. She's like skittering around on all fours at night in their hallways and stuff, and she's, um, it seems like there's something else kind of inhabiting her skin, like she's not acting like herself. And so Felix decides to go back to Colorado and try to figure out what's going on. He sees Faye's parents and they tell him that when she was five, they visited the family cabin and she had like a traumatic experience where she was like talking to someone unseen in the woods and she had kind of something, kind of like a seizure. It's meant to be, I think, supernatural, but she has kind of a seizure and that's when her night terrors started. So there's like a childhood link there. Throughout all of this too, this is where a lot of the criticism comes in. Uh, Felix, the main character, he's the only like POV character, is put into contact with a few native individuals. Now, I tried looking and I could not find if their tribe is ever actually named. It is a made up tribe and I cannot for the life of me find their name if they're ever named. <laughs> that might be a me fault or it might be, well, it is very unclear in the text because um, the characters don't like introduce themselves by their tribe's name, which is really, uh, I found quite unusual. But they enter the story. There's a, a, an older man named Tiway, his son, Nathan, and a, a, a woman around Tiway's age named Angela. And they exist, <laughs> to help Felix out and teach him about their tribe's cultural teachings. They come to the understanding that the creature that is kind of haunting Faye is 
from their cultural teachings. And I'm going to talk more about, like, in more detail about that in a little bit. But all you need to know is it, it comes from their teachings. They call him the Hollow One. He, like, envies the light and warmth and life of the living. And he, it's honestly very unclear what he wants. Um, he wants Faye. He is fascinated by her for reasons we'll get to in a moment. But, like, does he want to possess her? take her body, kill her, eat her, marry her. It's unclear. He's just kind of obsessed with her and is uh, uh, following her and tormenting her. There is uh, an escalation when Felix is staying at the- he's staying at the cabin in Colorado alone and the monster is there and um, how do I say this? He wakes up with its arm around his waist, which is creepy, admittedly. The story is creepy. It's not the best written, but the ideas in it are very scary. I think to me personally, there's just something viscerally horrifying <laughs> about thinking about waking up with something that is not my spouse's uh, arm around me. While he is at the cabin in Colorado, Tiwi and Nathan show up to just kind of exposit at him about their tribe, and then they leave for the night. And it's that night, sorry, I went about this a little bit out of order, but it's that night that the monster's arm is around Felix and he, how does he get him out of the cabin? I think he burns Sage to get him out of the cabin. And then the next day he goes looking for Faye's ring and he finds it at the center of the creepy dream catcher, which is not a dream catcher. He finds it there, but the monster shows up and is wearing Tiwei's face. And I mean, like, like his actual face has been removed from his body and the monster has it on his head. Uh, uh, we'll talk about it. We'll talk about it. Felix leaves. He goes home. Uh, Faye gets a little bit better when she has her ring back. Something about, like, something so personal to her. It allowed the monster to have, like, a more of a connection to her. But it's not over. I mean, the, the monster is still around and haunting them. Eventually, the kind of TLDR is that eventually Faye realizes that the reason it's fascinated with her is because when she, I think when she was five, her mother was pregnant and Faye was very excited to have a sibling, another sibling, because she has one sister. She was excited to have a little brother. I think it was going to be a little boy. And, um, the, the mother miscarried or had a stillbirth, which is very traumatic, and basically Faye was, she was young, so she was so traumatized that she repressed the memories very deeply. And the monster is fascinated by her because of that repression, I guess. There's like a mystery at her core that she like doesn't remember this experience of her childhood. And so she gets rid of the monster by telling him about her trauma <laughs> and I guess he goes back to Colorado which like good for her but <laughs> he's still there <laughs> um but that's the resolution it's not a good resolution which the author acknowledges now years down the road I will say that one of the criticisms I've seen online is that that doesn't seem realistic to people that this uh experience of hoping for and preparing for and anticipating a baby brother and then that baby brother dying unexpectedly. Like people don't believe that that would be so deeply traumatic that she would repress it her whole life and cause these night terrors and provide this like link to a, a monster, which the monster part obviously is supernatural. But I, I, I think that's a silly criticism. I think when you're a kid, things can traumatize you very deeply that maybe you would be more resilient and able to cope with as an adult. Um, I mean, the loss of a loved one is very difficult for people of any age and when you're a child and you don't really understand death uh, and loss and grief yeah i could see this becoming like a deep trauma so i think that's a silly criticism when there are like a ton of other criticisms to make of the book so speaking of let's get into some of those now i'm obviously the the reason for me making this video i'm going to be focusing on the aspects of native representation in the book uh there's a lot more that could be said that i'm just not gonna say because that's not what i want to talk about but um, I have some passages that I want to read just to kind of provide an idea of what we're working with here. And I might comment as we move through them or I might save my comments for the end. I don't know. We're going to find out as we go. We're just sitting here chatting. 
Um, so from near the beginning of the book, when they first arrive in Colorado, we get this reflection. I think they're in a coffee shop or they're in a, a store of some kind. And uh, Felix, the main character, is noticing the kind of like magazines and art that are around that are native uh, inspired or whatever. Uh, he says, the Rocky Mountains are rich in Native American history and lore. Virtually every place you can visit here used to be home to an indigenous community, and there is some effort to preserve that fact in the local economy for better or worse. It is possible to find authentic Indian wares in any of the thousand gift shops that dot the region, but finding portrayals of natives as anything other than fantastical heroes or mysterious savages is quite difficult. Pale Peak is no different. While buying groceries in town, the cashier eagerly regaled us the stories of magic and war. There is an industry here that sells a certain picture of the people who once inhabited these mountains. Mysterious Indians who performed rituals and fought with cowboys, then vanished altogether, leaving behind only arrowheads and legends about constellations. But that enthusiasm for all things Native American, however commercial, really does make the land itself feel alive and humming with memory. I don't know what to do with that last sentence, but um, I think what is being attempted here is a commentary on the kind of culture in Colorado, which I'm not from Colorado, I've never lived there. From what I understand, there is kind of a, an exoticization, is that a word? Um, and and mysticism, hmm. there's kind of exoticism and mysticism assigned to native cultures and history, despite the fact that, uh, like, like a kind of exoticism and mysticism without reckoning with the really ugly history. And so I think the author is, is trying to do a commentary on that. Some things strike me, and this is very early in the book, right? So this is kind of one of the first things we even see. And it, it, for one, it feels really unnatural. It feels, this is not really how the character thinks normally. And it feels like suddenly he's turned to me and is giving me like a mini lecture. So we're on the same page about Colorado. But also something that strikes me as odd is the use of the word lore. I feel like I hear this mostly among non-natives talking about native cultural teachings. It might seem like a small terminology, but I don't know. It gets used so much by non-natives in reference to native cultural teachings that it just starts to feel very, um, what is the word I'm looking for? Like it's making light of it in a way. And then of course this language of the natives inhabiting almost every area of Colorado and then vanishing, leaving behind only arrowheads and teachings about constellations. This is, of course, the vanishing Indian trope. And I think the author is trying to critique it, but not, not effectively. So, uh, but we'll move on. This is just like a tone setter, right, for, for really early on in the novel. But here we get our first introduction, uh, our introduction to our first native character, whose name is Tiwe, and Felix connects with him over the phone, basically a park ranger that helped Felix and Faye get down off the snowy mountain, um, connects him with Tiwe, who is a native, who lives in that area, and like I said, I don't know the name of his tribe, but his reservation is, I think, within walking distance of Felix and Faye's cabin, because he walks to see them. So, Tiwe picked up on the first ring. Felix, he answered, oh sorry, he answered in a dreary voice. I foresaw this conversation in a dream. Uh, hey, I replied, not knowing what to say to that. Tiwe let out a disarming laugh. I instantly got the sense that he was a nice guy, a friend. Bad joke, he said. Sometimes it's fun to play the part. For the tourists, you know. That was good, I, I admitted, letting out an awkward chuckle. All those magazines and gift shops they have out here. I can see why visitors get the wrong impression. The industry isn't really fair to us, Tiwe said. We're not all shamans and wise men. In fact, we cuss and dick around and use FaceTime, almost like you humans. I'm sorry, I replied. I felt a little weird calling you, and that's one of the reasons. Is it wrong of me to ask for your help with, uh, whatever this is? Isn't it a bit like asking a random Chinese guy to teach me kung fu? Tiwe laughed again. His voice was rich and textured, the kind you'd hear narrating a nature documentary. Well, he said, I guess if he's the one who offered it first. Okay, in that case, it's nice to meet you. Can you make my fiancé stop doing satanic shit in her sleep? We both cracked up. For the first time in days, I felt hopeful. Again, I, I don't want to overuse the word unnatural, but this feels very unnatural to me. This doesn't feel like how people speak. I'm also, maybe I just don't know the right elders, but I don't know any elders who um, like playing into tourist misconceptions. I, I mean, <laughs> I just, <laughs> I guess that's all I have to say about that. Um, 
there are a lot of very, very funny Native people and Native elders who like to joke around. I'm not taking issue with that. But this specific idea of like, yeah, there's so many tourist misconceptions and they treat us like we're not really human and like we're kind of an animal spectacle. And I like playing into that. It's like, okay, sure. <laughs> so Tiwe is in Colorado and at this point Felix and Faye are back in California where they live. And so Tiwe connects them with his friend Angela, who is also from his tribe. And she lives near them, I guess. So she comes over and she like walks through their house to kind of assess what's going on and asks them a bunch of questions. And then they there is this exchange that is quite long, but I do want to read it. Um, Angela arrived at our home by late afternoon and was just as warm and friendly as Tiwe. Her hair was straight and black with a sprinkling of gray. It framed a lean face with two green eyes, just like Faye's. Although my fiancé can be reserved around new people, she instantly took a liking to our guest, and within minutes they were complimenting each other's hair. So how do you know Tiwe? Faye asked. I dragged a chair into the living room while the two sat next to each other on the couch. He and I go way back, Angela said with an ill-concealed grin. I suspected that they were more than friends once upon a time. When we were kids, we lived next to each other on the reservation. His grandfather was a tribal elder, and he gave lessons on our people's language to me and my mother. There's a big effort to preserve native languages now, you know? That's amazing, Faye said. Can you speak it? Angela hesitated. It's been years since I've practiced, she replied. After my mom passed, I came out to California. Some members of my family are still upset with my decision, so I never had anyone to speak it with. Faye left Colorado to come here as well, I offered. You've got something in common, then. Angela put her hand on Faye's and smiled. Nahepa, she said. It can mean friend or sister, depending on how you use it. I don't know how to pronounce that word because it is a uh, made up. It is a uh, made up language. So. When we visited Pale Peak, we bought a magazine at the airport, I said. It mentioned something about how Indian or uh, native languages are dying. Faye glared at me. Angela noticed and laughed. It's all right, she said, patting Faye's hand. Most people don't read a damn thing about us. There's been some debate over how we should identify ourselves. Until recently, it was considered taboo to call us Indians. Until... Move on. Since the Europeans who called us that thought they were in India. But some communities embrace this name. Others prefer the term native for obvious reasons. I'm fine with either. The term indigenous is used in universities because it describes people who first inhabited the land in any place, not just the United States. Heck, the natives of Canada are sometimes called first people. And yes, my ancestral language is spoken by fewer and fewer people. This has been happening for hundreds of years. For a long time, people like me were taken from our nations and forced into schools where we'd learn English or Spanish and adopt European ways of life. The settlers wanted us to forget our cultures and spiritual traditions. They wanted us to be more like them, you see. So whole generations of natives grew up without ever hearing their own languages, and now very few of us speak them anymore. In fact, there are many languages that have been totally lost. Faye and I exchanged sad looks. The words I'm sorry welled up in my mouth, but it would have been a paltry thing to say. I regretted bringing up the subject. Angela noted our silence and rescued us. I came out here to study these issues at the university rather than remain with my community, and that's why I'm at odds with some members of my family. Thankfully, Tiwe has always been there for me, that old goat. He's quite a guy, I said. I didn't mean to make you sit here and explain all this to us. I hope... Don't even, she replied, silence me, silencing me with a hand. Some don't like talking about it. I do. That's my choice. Convenient for the narrative. <laughs> so Tiwe and Angela, upon being introduced, are immediately shuffled into the role of uh, existing to help the main character by divulging knowledge about their culture. I find the kind of like flippancy almost of this whole passage very strange. Um, language suppression via forced assimilation is a deeply traumatic part of many tribes histories and experiences uh, it's something that um, like for a lot of tribal elders who went to boarding school a, a lot of them just don't talk about it and that is like a, a silence that affects their family generationally I just, it, it's spoken of here so matter-of-factly, which I understand that, like, like to me, when I'm explaining things to non-Native friends, I might be matter-of-fact, so maybe I'm, I'm nitpicking a little bit, but it just seems like a very strange thing, one, to start explaining the moment you meet a new person, and two, to just kind of, like, breeze through very matter-of-factly. Yes, our languages are dying, this is why, and I like telling you these things. <laughs> and also, I think um, there's something that we talk about a lot when creating media about Native peoples, which is a, a deficit lens and focusing. I think this is a large conversation in kind of 
philanthropy spaces as well, where, you know, you like uh, a picture of a starving child sure does get a lot of attention. But then like, if the only way a certain community is being represented is by s pictures of starving children, and this image gets built in, in the American mind, more than the American mind, but I'm speaking about America right now, in the American mind that that's all those communities are, is, is suffering and pain and need and poverty and, and hunger. And in reality, um, not just native communities, but any community around the world. I mean, we, this is like a problem with the depiction of uh, countries in Africa as well and communities in Asia. And, and this is a, a problem in general <laughs> in kind of charitable spaces, so to speak. But um, that becomes the dominant image of that community, despite the fact that those are very intelligent human beings who are aware of the challenges facing their communities, but are also um, able to come up with these innovative solutions that are, are resilient and creative and, and have these rich um, cultures and inner lives. And the framing of like, our languages are dying and many languages already have, uh, just hits me in that same, um, it, it hits me as very deficit oriented. And also, I mean, I think there's a line, let's see, there's the line about, um, there's a big effort to preserve native languages now, you know? And uh, yeah, but there always has been one, right? Like the, the only reason our languages have survived is because there has always been an effort to preserve them and to pass them down to the future generation. And so um, it's just, a, just like a strange way of, of talking about this. And like I said, it, it strikes me as a little bit uh, deficit focused that like, uh, so many have died and they'll never come back <laughs> and many more are dying and less people speak them every year. I have not necessarily found that to be the case. I think in, uh, in maybe that is true in some places, but I think in, in some tribes, in a lot of tribes actually, there are probably more speakers now than there were a generation or two ago when there was forced suppression of the language happening. And there's all these revitalization efforts that are, are really powerful and meaningful. Um, so yeah, I, I don't want to like camp out on this passage too long, but uh, another thing obviously that's a little bit <laughs> interesting is just the primer. She's like, Indian, Native, Indigenous, First People, let me explain these to you. It's just like, she just arrived to deliver information to them, not to be like a real person. She's not a real, I know nothing about her <laughs> as a person. I also, sorry, not to camp out on this, but I just noticed as I was scrolling to the next passage I highlighted that she talks about, um, being forced into schools where they learn English or Spanish and adopt European ways of life, which is really, it is interesting because boarding schools were American as well. Like there were, of course, like Spanish missions and European schools, but uh, the era of the boarding school is not pre-1776. And so it almost feels like distancing historically to say, oh, my people were forced into these schools to learn European ways of life. It's like, no, it was American. Like the goal was American assimilation. So a little bit odd. Okay, let's move on to the next passage. So Angela, she thinks she can, she thinks she knows what creature is like following Felix and Faye. And she's explaining this to them. She says, our beliefs are a very private thing, but given your circumstances, I think Tiwe wants to make an exception. And I agree with him. Faye, your family has visited Pale Peak over the years, right? Faye nodded. My people tell a lot of stories about the mountain, Angela went on. Like any old place, there are legends and folk tales about things that happened long ago. Unfortunately, Pale Peak has a terrible history, so most of our stories are sad or scary. It would take a long time to explain how the creator and the soul work in my culture. So I'll try to say it like this, work in my culture. There are a lot of magical beings in our oldest stories. Most are manifestations of the earth or the spirits of ancestors and those who have passed on before us. But what you both are telling me reminds me of another creature. This one doesn't come from the world of the dead, but somewhere else, farther beyond it. I don't exactly know how to translate his name for you. You could call these creatures the hollow ones. They're jealous of living things and the joy of this world, jealous of its sunlight. They have none of it. Faye shifted in her seat. Sweat glistened on her brow. Why us, she asked. Why me? I don't know, Angela replied, offering a comforting smile. The legends say they try to coax children and gullible people into the dark with them. Take them away. I don't know much more than that. Now, I am um, not uh, an expert on tribal cultural teachings across the US. There are hundreds of tribes. I was trying to think if this like rang a bell to me. I saw a few reviewers uh, referring to the Wendigo as like inspiration for this monster. And I can see that in terms of a creature that is um, hungry and jealous for the life and warmth and vitality of the living. 
Uh, and also, the, the Wendigo is a creature that gets consistently butchered by horror media, just absolutely ripped from its cultural context and turned into um, just a, like a like a supernatural monster, literally, like the, the TV show Supernatural. Ugh. <laughs> I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> so I think that's a fair guess. I would be curious if the author... I mean, I think part of the, the, the thing about this book is there's a, a level of plausible, a plausible deniability where the author has created a fictional tribe, multiple fictional tribes actually, and a fictional language, fictional cultural teachings, and a fictional monster. So there is a level to which like if you ask too many questions or get too critical, the author can always be like, well, it's made up. Like you can't, <laughs> you can't criticize the inaccuracy because it's made up. It's not meant to be like a real tribe. Um, but obviously he was trying to create a monster that had its roots in like indigenous ideas, which is so vague and broad. Um, and I would imagine that he was probably inspired by kind of pop cultural perceptions of native creatures. I'm going to talk about this more in a little bit, but so they, they come up with this theory that Faye's missing engagement ring is, is significant and that she probably left it in Colorado. So Felix ends up like putting Faye up, like boarding a pet with some friends and going to Colorado alone, like I said earlier. And while he is there, he meets with Tiway and Nathan in person. Did I say Nathan's name? Tiway is Nathan's father. So these two other native characters. And they have a conversation um, that's quite long, and I'm going to read a good chunk of it. But this first part, um, Felix says, Angela mentioned that uh, natives are sometimes hesitant to share information with outsiders, I said, trying to remember her exact words. It's true, Tiwi replied, at least for my people. We aren't so cavalier in sharing our history. It's a very personal thing. You can't just tell the stories like a history teacher in a classroom. The setting matters, the audience matters, how you tell the story and where you tell it, why you tell it, it all matters. The wisdom of our fathers was spoken for generations, not written down and revised and published, not sold and archived. The Europeans thought we were backwards for this, and the anthropologists who visit us, they call this oral tradition. I guess it's fitting. So it's like a performance, I said, trying to demonstrate that I understood. But not for entertainment, T. Way bellowed. He immediately regretted the outburst and lowered his voice. Not always. This is how we keep our mothers' and fathers' teachings alive in the, mi in the minds of our children. The reason I highlighted this is because um, I found it odd. <laughs> so Felix says, Natives are sometimes hesitant to share information with outsiders. This is true. Um, this is like an ongoing issue in the U.S., uh, I think around the world with indigenous communities, but I can only speak to the U.S., where the government, um, federal agencies, uh, research institutions, universities, and just like tourists, people feel entitled to knowledge from tribes, uh, to, to tribal cultural teachings. Um, to tribal ecological knowledge, to tribal land knowledge and history. So <laughs> there, there is often a hesitance there from the tribal side, but the reason, the main reason at least, is not for the, for the reasons that Tiwe gives. So Tiwe says, we aren't so cavalier in sharing our history, it's very personal. You have to tell the stories in like like the setting and the audience, how you tell the story, all of that matters, which is so odd. Because I mean, yeah, like oral storytelling is a really big part of a, a lot of native cultures. I'm not uh, diminishing that. I wouldn't say that that's the main reason tribes tend to be hesitant to share their knowledge though. The main reason tribes tend to be hesitant to share their knowledge is because of a long history of extraction and exploitation. So a very basic example of this is um, tribes have traditional uh, bear, uh, gathering grounds where they gather certain foods and that they have always gathered foods in those grounds. They've always stewarded those grounds in a way that uh, promotes the continued growth of the food that they're gathering. And there has been an issue with like <laughs> foragers, like non-native foragers who like to live off the land, which is fair. I think learning what food grows in your area and wanting to eat it is fine. Uh, but they want that tribal knowledge so they know where to go get that food. And after sharing knowledge like this, people have then uh, exploited and in some cases really damaged those lands that the foods are gathered from. So there can be, uh, there is sensitivity surrounding certain cultural foods and where they're grown and how they're grown and what practices are used to gather them. Not because it's like 
I mean, it is special knowledge to the community, but also it's knowledge that has been used to cause harm in the past. So that's a, a food and ecological example, but on like a cultural level, I mean, those are, those are cultural teachings too, but on a level more like this story, let's talk about the Wendigo and the way that that teaching has been completely ripped from Anishinaabe context and made into a pop culture scary monster rather than, I mean, the, the real teaching, I think Robin Wall Kimmerer is a great example of if you want to read like that story in the context that it, it has for, for its community, <laughs> there's a really deep cultural value embedded in those stories. And it is a kind of extractivism to say, I take that, I take it from your culture and I make it mean what I want it to and I use it for my own entertainment and shock value. And now that becomes the dominant public narrative about that teaching. So there's there's a ton of examples like this. There's a long history of this kind of extractivism and exploitation that causes a hesitance from tribes to share information that is, is private or sensitive or culturally significant. So about the monster, the creature, Tiwe says, my people gave him the name Ata'an A'an Otagwa. Made up word, so I don't know how to pronounce it. So my way of pronouncing it is correct, I have decided. <laughs> the term refers to water and how it is formless until it fills a vessel. Angela wasn't wrong when she called him the hollow one because there is no direct translation really. Maybe it is more accurate to call him the imposter because this being fills himself with the life force of his prey. And Tiway's like, I'm gonna give you some historical background. He says, Colorado has been home to many groups. The Ute, Cheyenne, Arapaho, Pueblo, and Anasazi people have all called it home at one point or another. There are many more who came and left. War and famine and weather always shifted people around, but the big movements came when the gold rush spread here. Thousands and thousands of natives were displaced or killed. Mining operations forced people out of their ancestral homelands. That's something you have to understand about land, Felix, how we think of it. The settlers thought of land as a possession. You claim it and put a fence around it. You sign a piece of paper and it belongs to you. You sign another piece of paper and now it belongs to someone else. Doesn't matter where it is, land is all the same. You can even purchase land you've never seen before, never visited, a thousand miles away, and now it belongs to you. This is not how many natives understood the earth when the settlers came. The land doesn't just belong to us, we belong to the land. We were given to it just as much as it was given to us. Some even, some even believe we are of it, that we came from it. Our history is embedded in the physical landscape, anchored there by stories that convey our ancestral knowledge. A native is reminded of specific lessons when he sees a particular landmark. The mouth of this river has an important story attached to it. That fallen tree has one too. A battle was won here. An elder died there. Peace was made between warring tribes with a ceremony here. And so, when a native group is forced out of its homeland, the people sometimes forget their history. Their stories. History itself is lost. What's worse, they leave behind the places where their dead are buried. Their mothers and fathers. The dead are bound to that place and have returned to the land there. Because of this, natives who are forced out of their homelands no longer have connections to their ancestors and thus to the spirit world. Their medicines no longer work, their prayers are no longer heard. Eventually, the younger generations forget the names of sacred places, and as the names and history and wisdom are forgotten, the people's spiritual power diminishes. The culture collapses. How they perceive this change affects their whole way of life. Tiwe paused for my response, but I had no idea what to say. Nathan sensed my confusion and elaborated on his father's words. Think of Christianity and Judaism and Hinduism, he said. Those are universal religions. The Jews were scattered all across Europe and the Middle East, exiled from their homelands, and yet they remained Jews. Muslims and Hindus immigrate from the other side of the world to live here in the United States, and they bring their religions with them. You can move to New York tomorrow and still keep your religion. Your God can still hear your prayers. He can still intervene in your life. It is not so with the native, Tiwe exclaimed. Tiwe likes to just burst into unnecessary <laughs> bellowing. Um, it is much more difficult to recover those things when his land is stolen. This is why the anthropologists come to us. They want to ask us about our land-based religions. We're telling you this, Felix, because you cannot understand the supernatural presence on this mountain without understanding the mountain itself. I think you can, though. Uh, okay. I nodded, trying to digest his words as quickly as he spoke them. Tiwe took another long draw of his tea, probably to give me a moment to process everything. When the settlers arrived, he continued, they forced my people and a few other tribes out of the valleys where all the food grew. Some of us came to the mountain, and some went far away, never to return. When the settlers moved their mining operations farther up the mountain, they battled with our old neighbors, the Posse, or Posey, or po 
all of the pronunciation options sound silly to me. Um, it's a fake tribe, sorry, it's a made-up tribe. Many died on both sides. The remaining Pazi allied with the Anejo, also a made-up tribe, the people from the mountains to the north, and together they slaughtered dozens of the miners. The settlers mounted a counterattack and murdered hundreds in retaliation. This went on and on, back and forth for a long time, until the alliance collapsed and the natives turned against each other. Why did they do that? I asked. Tiwe nodded at his son. No one knows, Nathan said. Some believe the settlers bribed the Pazi. Colonists have always used bribery to turn natives against each other, made them fight in their wars. It is said that the Anejo found out about these bribes and killed many of the Pazi, then stuck holes and buried them with their feet sticking out of the ground. Legend says they wanted the wolves to eat the meat on their legs so that the Pazi could never make the journey back to their homeland, even in death. Okay, um... Uh... <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. Okay, where to, where to begin? Let's talk about Colorado. The state of Colorado recognizes 48 tribal nations as having ancestral ties to the land that is now the state of Colorado. There was a native group called the Troop Truth Restoration and Education Commission, um, a native group based in Colorado that did a more like legally rigorous assessment of tribes with Aboriginal title, Congressional title, and Treaty title. Um, and using those parameters, they identified 10 federally recognized tribes today that meet these criteria. I'll put the list on screen, but those are the Southern Ute, the Ute Mountain Ute, the Ute Indian Tribe of Utah, Kiowa, Comanche, Apache of Oklahoma, Eastern Shoshone, Northern Cheyenne, Northern Arapaho, and the Cheyenne and Arapaho of Oklahoma. These are real tribes that have real ties to the land of Colorado, not just the valleys, as uh, Tiwe was talking about being driven out of the valleys, which um, some tribes certainly were, but also to the mountains themselves. Real tribes with real painful histories of being driven from their land, uh, oftentimes violently and almost always illegally. So a quick note about U.S. history here. Um, under U.S. law, uh, it was illegal for settlers to go settle in native land. Um, the, the legal mechanism for getting that land was treaties, right? So, so treaties would be signed on tribes, often under coercive circumstances. We really don't have the time to get into all of that right now, but um, it just, it should go without saying that treaties were often very shady and were often not made on equal footing, but regardless, they were the mechanism by which land was ceded to the U.S., and so then U.S. settlers could go settle and mine and farm and whatever in that land. In reality, what often happened, and what definitely happened in Colorado, was settlers pushed further west because they wanted, uh, I mean, especially in Colorado, the, the gold rush pushed into lands that had not been ceded, and therefore they were there illegally. <laughs> you know, each state and region has its own kind of unique history and, and unique story with the native communities that have called that land home since time immemorial. And I'm not an authority on Colorado. I'm not trying to speak for Colorado's history um, because there are living communities today that that is their, their ancestral homeland. I'm not, I'm not trying to supersede over any of that, but Colorado's history is particularly hideous, <laughs> I would say. It's very, very ugly, very violent. Colorado is the, the site of the Sand Creek Massacre, a, a horrible, deeply traumatic event for the communities that survived it. And I'm going to put a map on screen, actually, of the reservations in Colorado. There are two reservations in the, the southwestern corner of the state. And you might notice, looking at the map, that they're quite small. <laughs> and so think of this whole state being inhabited by various tribes. Um, if you want like a visualization of that, you can go to nativeland.ca and see the many tribes that would have called that land home on some level and compare that to the reservation land today and what you see is that the native nations of Colorado were violently driven from their homes and that most of them do not have land there anymore. And there's a movement today to return some land to those tribes because uh, in some cases the, there were treaties that promised them land in Colorado and those treaties were, were violated and the U.S. government went back on them so I bring all this up because I find, and I am not a Colorado native, but I find it baffling and terrible that the author has decided to create a fictionalized history of Colorado 
and create a community that, as, like I said, as far as I know, is not named, but Nathan and Tiwe's tribe has a reservation in the Colorado mountains. I don't want to get fully into it now because I have some more in-depth thoughts about like fictionalized native tribes for, for later, I think. But in this specific instance, I find it inexcusable, honestly, um, to overwrite real history with one that you've made up created an alternate history for those tribes that you've invented that now is overriding real history of real tribes that have real descendants alive today. I just, I, I find it to be a terribly irresponsible decision made for the convenience of the author and the story he wanted to tell. There are other things that struck me as, as strange in this passage. Um, again, we see this kind of deficit focus, or uh, there might be a, a better word for that in this case, but um, a focus on loss, and I, I, <laughs> a lot of harm has been done to Native communities over the centuries since first contact, and much has been lost, much has been taken, and being honest and realistic about that is necessary, absolutely. I don't just object to mentioning it in general, but the focus on like cultures dying as people are driven from their lands, I don't think is appropriate uh, for this non-native author to be trying to handle in his book. I also don't think it's really accurate. Um, this is not my realm of, of knowledge and experience, but I imagine that um, tribes who were forcibly removed hundreds if not thousands of miles from their homelands would object to the idea that because of that removal they can't practice uh, their spirituality and their cultural practices. Obviously things change, right? Like your relationship to the land, especially if you're in a different climate with different species, like uh, you adapt, but tribes are very proud of their resilience and their ability to survive uh, and, and to recover and to build thriving communities despite the many challenges and the amount of harm that has been caused over the years. So I just think this way of framing it, like, um, you know, you leave behind the land where your dead are buried, therefore you don't have a connection to your ancestors or to the spirit world, your medicines no longer work, your prayers are no longer heard. I just, again, this is not my realm of, of expertise to talk about, but um, I don't think that's accurate. I, I don't think tribal elders and um, cultural teachers and spiritual leaders would necessarily agree with this framing, but that is my speculation based on experience working with tribes, not uh, not personal life experience. So, I also think it's just kind of uh, strange that the central conflict highlighted here is between tribes, uh, which is, I mean, there's no use painting an overly rosy view of history. Tribes were in conflict with one another often, <laughs> uh, pre-European contact. But we are talking about settlers pushing into native lands, which did cause conflict often because they were pushing tribes into other tribes' lands, and it, it, it did cause conflict, yes. But um, it, it talks about, you know, these, these two tribes allying with one another to fight settlers, and then it kind of glosses over, like, that went back and forth on and on for a while, and a lot of people died. But what really mattered is when the tribes turned against one another, and there was this very violent event where they buried uh, their enemies with their feet poking up out of the ground. Um, it's just, I, I guess I don't really, I can't say much more other than it's just odd. It's a, it's a strange thing to focus on. It reminds me a little bit of what I said earlier about the focus of the boarding schools being European rather than American. Um, it, it just feels like a way of distancing history. Like, yeah, settlers did push into their land and cause a lot of conflict, but ultimately, the really defining violent event on this mountain were, uh, you know, was this this violent conflict between two tribes. So the reason for all of this backstory is given as um, they believe the the imposter, the monster, is drawn to sites of terrible suffering. Um, and so it says that shortly after the Pazi slaughter, the Anejo suffered a tragedy of their own. Every child in one of their villages disappeared. Um, and so they think that the imposter lured them <clears throat> into the wilderness, stole their skin and hair, hung them in the trees, and then um, led other children deep into the mines. And they're 
they're, they were never seen again, but their voices still echo on the mountain. So I guess this is an extension of my earlier thought that, again, the the defining great tragedy, the, the site of terrible suffering that this monster was drawn to was um, an incident of violence between two tribes. Uh, there are some really interesting articles online about horror and indigenous representation in horror. And one of the points that gets made is that you don't need to fictionalize history to write a horror story uh, that features indigenous people and indigenous history because um, indigenous communities have lived through their own horror stories. And if you, I mean, you don't want to, I'm not advocating for sensationalizing history. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying that you, you don't need to invent tragedy. Um, you don't need to invent suffering. And it's odd that in the state where the Sand Creek Massacre occurred, that this author has just made up a violent event and it's, it has nothing to do with the settlers. It just has to do with the tribes attacking one another. It's just, um, it's, it's very strange to me. After their conversation, they go outside and Felix shows them the dream catcher, which I, I can't refer to it as anything else because it's all the story refers to it as. But uh, Tiwi says, I don't think this is really a dream catcher. Like, you think. Um, he manipulated it with a stick rather than touching it with his hands. Why is that? I asked. Well, I don't know for sure. My people don't make these. In fact, very few native tribes do. They've sort of come to represent all Indians, but they're not some universal thing we all use. The reason I think it's something else is become, because dream catchers were made for protection and balance. This one was made using symbols of death. Tiwi pointed at the jagged bones and bloodied feathers. And the woven pattern here is a disaster. It could be sloppy craftsmanship, but it could also be intentional to represent chaos. So here we have lip service paid to the fact that dream catchers are not a tradition of Colorado tribes. Um, it doesn't it doesn't say who they are a tradition of. Um, Dreamcatchers come from the Ojibwe. And it, I think in the 50s or 60s, I'll, I'll put it on screen if I need to correct myself, they became kind of part of a pan-Indian movement, but um, they have always been Ojibwe in nature, and they're positive. This just strikes me as um, using something that is, to the average American, <laughs> recognizably Native American in aesthetic, with no real engagement with why it's in the story. <laughs> and like, we don't get an answer for why it's here. We never find out who made it. Uh, we never find out why it's hanging in the woods near the cabin and why there's another one at their place in California. Like what function does it serve? What is it doing? Aside from just being like a creepy set piece, it's just very, it's very cheap to me. Um, just like relying on something for a certain aesthetic without engaging at all with its cultural significance and origin. The next few passages I have to read have to do with bodily mutilation. So I just wanna like give a little warning beforehand. I found this very disturbing and not in the way that the author wanted me to, I don't think. Um, but like I mentioned, uh, Tiwe ends up dying. Tiwe gets, gets killed fairly early on after um, he sees Felix in the cabin. And I think I mentioned that Felix goes out to retrieve Faye's ring and when he turns around the monster is there wearing Tiwi's face. Um, but Nathan calls Felix after, after Felix returns to California, Nathan, Tiwi's son, calls him and says, you know, they, they found his father's body. And so the details about this are, they found him at the mouth of a cave. Something dragged him in, but he crawled back out. He died without his clothes. The body was mutilated. Someone took his skin and hair, took his teeth. So after this, Felix sees the, they just, they start calling the monster the imposter. Felix sees the imposter near their house and he ends up chasing him. I mean, he's like angry. So he ends up chasing him through some fields and stuff. And I don't even remember where they stop. They end up stopping somewhere. And the imposter starts speaking to him and turns around and it says, staring down at me, boring into my soul with lidless eyes was the face of Nathan, my friend, my protector, the son of a man who had given his life to help me. Now his skin was hard and bruised, his scalp flayed, his eyes tormented. His features didn't quite fit the skull they'd been stretched over, and the whole mess was propped up by a body that rattled with loose, collected bones. Um, I think there's one more, and then I'll, I'll say this, yeah. Uh, they found Nathan's body, this is um, later, a search party is sent to find Nathan. They found Nathan's body approximately a quarter mile in, buried upside down with his legs erupting from the soil at the knee. Upon exhumation, it was discovered that his face and scalp had been flayed. I understand that things happening in books does not equal the author endorsing those things. That would be highly overly simplistic of me. Um, I was very disturbed by these passages 
For one, um, two of the three native characters we meet are brutally killed, and they're the only ones brutally killed. In fact, Nathan's friend also is killed. I don't even know if he's named, but he's native and he's killed. Um, so already just really bad optics that your native characters showed up on page specifically to serve the main characters. They had no real life and characterization of their own outside of teaching the main character and then saving his life. And then their deaths are used as his kind of grief fuel and, and fuel for his anger. And so uh, already, <laughs> that's bad. That's really bad. <laughs> but also, um, I found myself sickened with these descriptions. And I, I get that with horror, there is an expectation that there are going to be things that are that are meant to be sickening and disturbing. I get that, but when you take into account historical context, I find it, um, I just find it really disturbing that these two native characters are scalped and mutilated and their bodies are disassembled for shock value, I guess, on the page, when mutilation of native bodies is a very real part of, uh, of American history. And in Colorado, after the Sand Creek Massacre, native body parts were paraded through town as part of a celebration. Of course, we, we um, know the history of, of scalping. And um, also, I think there, there's a, something to be said about the violation of native graves and the taking of things and body parts from native graves for um, personal collection or for museums or for studies. And so this idea of like Tiwi's teeth being missing. Um, I just think when you, when you know and are being thoughtful about the historical context of native communities in Colorado, you, you would never write something like this. I, I can't imagine thinking it's appropriate to write this and it's only your native characters. There's, there's no, there's no white character who is shown with a mutilated body and body parts missing and, and scalped. The book tries to frame it as, you know, Felix really cared for these men. They were his friends. He loved them. He's devastated by their loss. But I don't buy it. He's known them for a month, tops. All they've done is help him. Like, he doesn't know them. What, what does he know about them? Nothing except for the teachings they've decided to impart upon him. Their deaths are plot devices to move the story forward, to cause grief and trauma and make him angry and want to beat the monster, and that's it. And 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 to horrify the reader. That's that's what their deaths are for. So I just I, I just find it um, really unacceptable, frankly. Those were all the passages that I wanted to share. Now we we get to talk about the author's note because. <laughs> Sorry, I just, sometimes people make decisions that you're like, huh, interesting. So we're going to read through this author's note together. I think we're probably going to end up reading the whole thing. It's not incredibly long. And then we'll get to return to that Reddit post from earlier this year. So a word on natives in fiction. How should a non-native person write about natives in a work of fiction? Does he have the right? Is it unethical to do so? These questions racked my brain throughout the entire process of authoring this book. <laughs> Did they? My fear was that I would misrepresent natives like so many Hollywood films have over the decades and portray them as something other than what they are, people. Like anyone else, they are people with cultures, beliefs, histories, and ideas about how the world should work. They can be just as interesting or boring as anybody else, except they are lesser known and therefore somewhat mysterious to outsiders. Why should I care about misrepresentations and stereotypes? Many books and films, widely regarded as masterpieces, portray indigenous people or black people or women or LGBT people as flat and one-dimensional, often to terrible ends, and they do so with waning impunity. I care because indigenous peoples are especially vulnerable to the effects of misrepresentation. They are perhaps the most submerged, marginalized, and underrepresented ethnic community in the United States and in many other countries around the world. By this I mean, among other things, that indigenous peoples do not have the public station they would require to combat or correct these misrepresentations. They are often ignored by the media, they are reduced to brief mentions in history classes, they are not cast in any significant number as actors or elected as politicians, they are mostly reflected through other lenses, like movies and TV shows and books like this one. Historians refer to them sometimes as peoples, by the way, to indicate that they are not just one group. It's an odd ending note. It feels like a non sequitur. It also very much so feels like the author has positioned himself as a teacher on this. Historians refer to them as peoples, by the way. 
Okay. Okay, buddy. <laughs> um, I spent a long time debating whether it was unethical to write a horror story centered on a creature inspired by Native American lore. Yes. My answer to this, my opinion, is yes. If you are not Native, um, there, there's a, a, a kind of catchphrase that gets thrown around related to art specifically, um, like visual art and jewelry and clothing, stuff like that, that says, don't buy native inspired, buy from inspired natives. And the, the phrase, you know, inspired by native American lore. What does that mean? Like what tribe, what culture, what creature, what do you mean by inspired by native American lore? Because it, it's just made up with just like a veneer of native aesthetics on top to distinguish it and make it seem I don't know, edgy or different. So my my opinion, my inclination would be, yes, it's, it's you are more likely to be unethical than ethical if you are a non-native person writing a horror story inspired by Native American lore. Because what does that mean? What culture are you referring to? What experience do you have with that culture? How do you know that the story you're writing is not going to damage that culture through misrepresentation? And how do you know that you're not contributing? I mean, horror, I think, is especially notorious for yanking Native teachings from specific tribes and specific cultures and specific contexts and just using them as boogeymen. I mean, think about, we're gonna talk about Indian burial grounds in a little bit, so I'm putting that off a tiny bit, but think about like majorly famous stories like Pet Cemetery, where the whole twist relies on an Indian burial ground. What tribe, who knows, <laughs> why would that burial ground have uh, sinister magical properties. Who knows? It doesn't matter. It's just being used to add flavor to your story, to add a bit of mysticism, a bit of exoticism. It's not actually engaging in any meaningful way with indigenous communities who are real people, not mythical ideas or concepts. Okay, sorry, I got heated, but theoretically, could a non-native writer write a horror story inspired by a specific teaching or creature from a specific native culture in an ethical way. Theoretically, yes. Have I seen it done? <laughs> no, have I seen it done poorly and unethically over and over and over and over to the point that it seems almost endemic to the genre? Yes, so just stop doing it. <laughs> Okay, let's move on with the author's note. In graduate school, while training to become a history teacher, I worked with an indigenous professor and had the rare privilege of hearing from this person's own mouth the many plights of natives inside and outside academia. I studied the ways in which the Western paradigm of knowledge production, ethnographies, archaeological digs, research trips, interviews, etc., conflicted with indigenous concepts of knowledge, which is, sac which is often sacred, private, powerful, and therefore worth protecting from outsiders. Today, there is an effort among historians to decolonize native studies, meaning to critically examine the ways indigenous histories and cultures are taught, who is teaching them, why this information is being taught, and what effects this education has on the relationships between native and non-native populations. It is, um, I'm not gonna get mad. Being able to write these words while not realizing that you are, you as a non-native person are, are writing a story that overwrites history, real history of tribes in Colorado, um, is crazy. <laughs> just, just like, what? Okay, okay. Um, the premises of this movement, the uh, decolonizing Native Studies, the premises of this movement are that one, most of the knowledge we, non-Natives, have of Indigenous people was gathered in ways that might have injured the communities it was extracted from. Two, there are very, very few Natives actually teaching this knowledge to the public. It is instead being taught by non-Natives and is therefore more susceptible to misinterpretation and misrepresentation. And three, natives are limited in their ability to combat these problems in our education system or to mitigate the potential negative effects this style of education might have on their communities. Uh, interesting how he can outline this in a number of lists without recognizing the way he's participating in the very problem he's identifying. Uh, this is a hot button subject. There are strong opinions on all sides of the debate. Right, but what opinions do the actual people involved have? What, what are the opinions of native folks? I went about making this decision carefully. I asked a few colleagues of mine, it's careful, <laughs> a few colleagues of mine, and their hesitation about including native characters in this book was unanimous. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
Some of them were concerned that I would do a poor job in my portrayals. Other were, others were simply fearful that I would offend somebody, regardless of the quality and accuracy of the writing. After all, we grad students operate at the physical epicenter of this debate, on university campuses where social justice and its occasionally conflicting interpretations are on the lips of every student. I wouldn't say this, um, that the, the physical epicenter of the conversation about how to represent natives in media is on university campuses. Um, that seems myopic to me. The, the physical epicenter of that conversation is among tribes and, and among native communities, some of whom are on college campuses, sure, but many of whom are not. Um, non-native university folks can talk all they want about native representation, but uh, the, the physical epicenter of the conversation is, is wherever those communities are. So, after much deliberation, I decided to write the characters I wanted to write. Yes, we can tell. <laughs> it is, after all, impossible to satisfy every person's expectations when it comes to representing a group or even describing a single member of one, and there seems to be a great diversity of opinion on whether fiction authors should channel the socio-political zeitgeist. Thus, I have little doubt that someone will be upset by the inclusion of natives in my story, and conversely, I suspect that someone else would be outraged had I excluded natives entirely for the purpose of political correctness. This, so much of this author's note feels like straw men to me, because one, he says it's impossible to satisfy every person's expectations, but when he consulted with people, they were unanimously concerned about his inclusion of native characters. Also, uh, who would be outraged about you writing a horror story that doesn't have native characters? That's a crazy statement to make. I earlier this year read a house, was that this year or last year? Sometime within the last two years, I guess, I read A House with Good Bones by T. Kingfisher. And I don't know if horror is actually the genre or if it's more of a supernatural thriller. I'm, I'm a little muddy on the differences between those genres, but um, <clears throat> it's a horror-leaning story that's set in rural America and has to do with generational trauma and has to do with um, supernatural occurrences tied to the land itself. And it has nothing to do with native communities. And I guarantee you, if I were to scroll through the reviews of that book, I would not find a single one saying, how dare this story not include Native Americans? I just, <laughs> who would have said that about this book? You can create I think the, t the A House of Good Bones is a great example. You can create an entirely original story with stakes, with emotional weight, with close uh, loving relationships, with uh, like twists that you have to kind of uncover, and with creep factor that does not rely on cultural appropriation and extraction. Like that is just a, a wild statement to make. <laughs> Let's keep going. Ultimately, I decided to write about natives simply as people and try to avoid the common stereotypes that harm their communities. We're going to talk about tropes and stereotypes, so I, I will try not to go on a tangent here about that. Um, however, I would say that maybe that was the intent, but these characters were not written about as people. They, they do not come across as a human. The, the, the way they speak and deliver information and just exist to serve the main character. It, they're not written as three-dimensional people. First, I chose to fictionalize the names of the people groups that my native characters belong to, so as not to mischaracterize the beliefs, cultures, or histories of any real tribes. Right, but you did overwrite the history of real tribes, which is a problem. <laughs> Second, I tried to texturize the characters such that they were not one-dimensional characters, caricatures of real people. I did not want the natives in my story to be expert advisors on all things spiritual. That is the role they filled. They weren't necessarily experts, but they were spiritual advisors, and that was pretty much their only role. I did not want them to use mythical powers to ultimately banish an evil that only they understood. I did not want them to have all the answers. As a fan of horror, I've seen these caricatures before, and frankly, they are boring, not to mention potentially harmful. But potentially, okay. Instead, I wanted Tiwe and his family to struggle with their memories and heritage and where those things fit in with their everyday experience of the world, something we all endure to varying degrees. I wanted their world and experiences to make them forget some things, important things. I also feared to head too far in the direction of the vanishing Indian. It would be remiss of me to articulate these characters as relics of a forgotten past, lost in a modern world they do not recognize as their own. They should not appear as a dying species of aliens on the precipice of extinction, ready to be consigned to the annals of history. 
In reality, indigenous communities are suffering in manifold ways which deserve more than a brief mention at the end of a horror novel, but they are also thriving in other ways. Cultural and language preservation e efforts, though hotly debated and often managed by outsiders, do help to ensure that precious elements of native life ways do not vanish forever. Too many have already, and most of us will never know about it. Indigenous rights and recognition movements, although constantly faced with structural opposition, racism, and the legacy of centuries of violent oppression, are experiencing moderate success in directing badly needed attention to policy issues that affect natives across the United States. Native professors have constructed entire academic departments and authored award-winning books to introduce the many histories of indigenous peoples to the public, and they do so with decolonization in mind and practice. The road will always be arduous and full of pitfalls for them, but my point is that Indians are hardly a single idle people waiting to disappear, or mythical spellcasters, or foolish alcoholics for that matter, and should not be portrayed so flatly in fiction. They are many peoples with many histories, many cultures, many languages, and many adversities and triumphs. And while I did not have the creative space to describe the disadvantages that likely plague Tiwe's reservation, nor would it be your place to do so, nor its probable efforts to overcome them, I tried at least to write what I think is a dignified and complex set of characters who offer something to the reader other than mere amusement. This is the bare minimum. <laughs> it's, it's interesting to end a book with a treatise about how native peoples are not their very worst stereotypes. As if that's like a profound thing to say. Okay, we're, we're approaching the end. Um, I'm glad I made the choice I did. I'm not. My first large audience, thousands of Redditors, were overwhelmingly receptive of Tiwe and the little bits of history he shared. It has been over a year since the release of the original story and I still receive emails to this day from readers interested in learning more about the plights of indigenous people groups. Why plights? As a writer who believes that fiction can be educationally valuable, this is extremely heartening. This story is not educational because you made up history and you made up culture and you made up language. The, the one thing I will say here is if people genuinely have contact with him wanting to learn more about Native history, that is great. Um, I hope that they've been directed to actual factual resources and have learned more and supported real living Native communities. This digression is not to serve merely as a defense of my decision to write Indigenous characters. It should, it's like one of those like the lady doth protest too much situations. Um, it should also serve as a think piece to be grappled with by readers. Why is it your job to create a think piece for readers to grapple with the reality of indigenous e existence? I don't know, like what is the think piece here? I'm having a lot of thoughts, but they're not, <laughs> I don't think they're the thoughts you want me to have. I wanted to write about people and I have done that. Local man proclaims that native peoples are humans and gets big award, more news at five. The people in this story are all colored by my experiences, my personal interests, my desires and perceptions, and do not represent anyone but themselves. They were, however, developed with the aforementioned problems and debates in mind. As a person who has trained for the past several years to be a teacher, I think we should be bringing attention to the experience of indigenous communities in a multitude of mediums in the classroom, in the political forum, in the arts, instead of avoiding them and creating worlds of education and entertainment where natives simply do not exist. My way of doing this, of writing horror, is not nearly the most effective way. <laughs> but perhaps it will have some positive effect on someone. It did not have a positive effect on me. <laughs> and perhaps that person will choose to read further on these issues. If you do find this subject engaging, I personally recommend the book, Wisdom Sits in Places by Keith H. Basso which is a short and move moving ethnography on the Western Apache that has had great influence on me as an academic and as a member of the human race. Wisdom Sits in Places by Keith H. Basso is a book written by a white ethnographer. So it's, it's, uh, it's interesting to see an author's note about Native representation in fiction with a book like this, where I would say the representation is minimal used to fuel a story and not to engage with actual themes. The themes of this book are uh, grief and trauma for Faye, right? And the way that um, has caused like a darkness to follow her throughout her life and her processing and grappling with that. I don't think those themes are written well, but those are the themes of the story. Those don't, the native characters don't serve that theme. They serve the plot, and they serve an explanation for where the monster came from, 
And that's it. So to write all these words about how native experiences need to be included more in fiction, native peoples need to be treated as humans, their cultures need to be engaged with in a respectful manner and not erased from history. Like, this book is not like a profound, it just, it feels so like aggrandizing to me. And I'm not trying to import any, um, I'm not trying to assume anything about the author's mindset or intent while writing this, but the way it feels as a reader to read that is like, do you think you did something revolutionary and profound? Because you didn't, like you just plainly didn't. So um, let's talk about tropes because one of the points he's making is not writing stereotypes. And I agree, but I think um, he didn't avoid stereotypes or overused tropes. A channel called Native Media Theory put out these two videos about indigenous people in horror, and I would really recommend them. They're, they're not very, I think it's like 30 minutes total, both videos. They're not super long, but I really appreciate it. He just walks through some of the really um, common tropes that are very tired of regarding indigenous people in fiction. And he makes the point that indigenous teachings, indigenous lore, as people like to refer to it, are seen as fuel for exoticism and mysticism. And in his first video, he goes into like speculation about why that is like historically speaking. But in the second video, he talks about the really common tropes that surround indigenous representation and horror. The first one is the ancient Indian burial grounds, which I think we've all seen, so I don't think I need to go into a lot of detail about it, but it plays into this um, feeling of colonial guilt and also morbid curiosity. There's this sense of like, we've pushed a community from their land and all that's left is, is they're dead. And what if they're dead or malevolent or angry or there's some power attached to that burial ground? Uh, that is used a lot in horror. I, I mentioned Pet Cemetery already, but um, Amityville, The Shining are also examples. There's a video game that happens in as well, but I can't remember the name. But did you catch, did you catch the Indian burial ground? In, in Stolen Tongues, because <laughs> I, because uh, it's not called a burial ground, but the, the site of a literal burial of a tribe, burial with their feet sticking out of the ground, that site is what drew the monster to that mountain. So, we checked one trope box. <laughs> Number two, the indigenous cryptid. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> what just happened? Uh, number two is the indigenous cryptid. So this it involves the removal of a creature from its culture and its specific teachings and its context. Um, or it just is making one up that has a native flavor and usually has a native character exposit about it. I'd really recommend watching the second video in this series, even just the first two minutes because there's a little skit at the beginning that is related to this and it's very funny. Um, but clearly I don't think I even need to explain how this uh, trope is in Stolen Tongues as well. Uh, not necessarily ripping a creature from a specific culture, but um, inventing one and having native characters exposit about it and giving it kind of native flavor. And then three, indigenous lore as a source of antagonism. So indigenous mysticism is the reason something bad is happening. And the thing that all of these tropes have in common and that other tropes also feed into is putting native perspectives on the back burner. So these elements that resemble somehow, even in just the loosest way, some kind of native culture or teaching or creature is it only exists to serve a different plot and different characters. It's not actually engaging with the communities that it comes from. It's not engaging with the native perspective on those things. And the native characters only exist to serve an external uh, community or individual. So why do I care? Why does this matter? Well, this novel became quite popular. Uh, many people love it. And I want to read just a, a sampling of positive reviews that I found. So one reviewer says, I like the reverence and respect shown to Native American beliefs, both the beliefs themselves and the indigenous people's attitudes toward their beliefs and sharing them with outsiders. As the novel's monster draws heavily from Native American culture, what culture? <laughs> That's not, uh, uh, whatever. It's refreshing to see so much respect. 
Often horror that draws on Native American folklore and ideas doesn't always include the very peoples from whom the, those folklores and ideas derive from, and when they do, not always in the most respectful manner, so it's a welcome change to see said folklore as well as Native characters portrayed with such care. Another review. I was a little hesitant being that this story includes Native American legends and characters, but the author did include a note at the end that he decided to write this novel to help elevate these narratives, and it was done through extensive research and interviews. No, that, that was not in the author's note, and uh, no, there's no story being elevated because he made it up, and he overwrote existing tribes' histories in doing so. Another review. He handles native stories with utmost care and respect, taking a step towards a particular kind of terror not everyone can pull off. Another review. I love the concept of the creature in the story, and the author does a decent job representing indigenous people in his writing, even noting this in an epilogue to the epilogue. So this is why uh, the inclusion of the author's note to some reviewers was a great plus, because it, um, I guess it seemed really legit to them and, and really helpful being told that native peoples are human. <laughs> Um, another review, it's respectful to the indigenous characters by treating them like ordinary people and not mysterious foreign stereotypes like so many books and shows do. Okay, the bare minimum, again, the, the bare minimum. No one should be praised for writing indigenous pe characters like humans. <laughs> another review, Stolen Tongues contains frightful in imagery, empathetic portrayal of individuals in distress, as well as a very sensible depiction of indigenous people and their culture. Make sure to read the author's notes regarding his writing process. So people really do refer to the author's note as if it, it is an incredible justification and authorization of the choices that this author made, despite the fact to me it, it reveals a, a, a stunning <laughs> lack of awareness. <laughs> Again, this idea of indigenous people and their culture as if there is one indigenous culture, which is crazy because indigenous people are, are international, they're everywhere. Uh, but also, even if we're just talking about Native Americans, there is no one Native American culture. Another review, amazing representation of indigenous people and spirituality written with so much respect. Another positive review, I also love that there was an indigenous aspect, especially done in a respectful manner. The author addresses this at the end, again, the author's note. So the reason I care is because this representation of uh, Native culture, so to speak, is one of the perks for people. This is something that has been praised. When at the end of the day, it's misrepresentation, it is using native characters as plot devices, and it is not to harp on the same point over and over again, but I'm gonna, overwriting real history in Colorado. And I, I like when I read the historical section of T.W.A. explaining what happened in Colorado, I picked up immediately on which tribes were made up and the, the story part of it that was fake. But if, if you don't have any familiarity with tribal history in Colorado, you wouldn't know how to distinguish between what parts are real and what parts are fake. And I personally find that irresponsible, especially when the tribes of Colorado in the present day are fighting to have access to their lands again. And they're fighting for just public awareness of their existence and their history. It just, I, I think it's very irresponsible to do what you're doing in this story by making up a false history. Uh, someone, someone on StoryGraph um, said, while Felix states he wanted to be respectful by using lore inspired by indigenous legends, rather than using real stories and tribes, it personally comes across as lazy. By not wanting to misrepresent those things, it bypassed the real research and care needed to prop up a concept as deeply rooted in history, religion, and culture. And I absolutely agree. There's also a long review on StoryGraph that I'll probably link in the video description because it is really good. Um, but this reviewer says in a later section, they say, so yeah, this author just bungled everything up. I think the line that got me most in his author's note and which sums up the lack of self-awareness was the author claiming that people would be hurt if he decided to write this novel and would be hurt if he decided not to write this novel. Only one of those is true. Native Americans may be hurt by the appropriation of their lore in the writing of this. No way are people going to be hurt if this novel wasn't written. Who do you think would be hurt if this novel wasn't written? White folks claiming cancel culture? Who? No one. That's who. There is an article called Native Spirituality is Not for Sale that I will also link in the description below because I'm not going to read the whole article. The subtitle of this article is Colonizers once tried to erase indigenous culture, now they exploit it. And the concluding paragraph of this I want to read out, it says, But let it be said, forgive me for my repeated majestic plural use, that we see this, all of it. 
we see the historical erasure. We see how textbooks conclude native history in the 19th century. We see the companies that would seek to profit off what was stolen from us. At the moment, there is little we can do about It Chapter 2 or Johnny Depp's demeaning Dior cologne line Sauvage or the Indian burial grounds deployed in Pet Cemetery, save for remind their creators that they are wrong. We are not gone, and we are not theirs to lean on when their own imaginations and bland cultures fail them. Hundreds of native cultures are still here, beautiful as ever and exploited as ever. I only hope that one day we get to tell our stories the way they deserve to be heard. So one would hope, you know, this novel was published in 2017, the author has gone on to write more novels, he received a lot of support for this book, but he also received a lot of criticism. One would hope some self-reflection would occur, especially because I really do believe that his intentions were good, that he really did want to do something positive for Native peoples. I, he didn't, <laughs> in my opinion, but I do believe that was the intent, right? And so one would hope that he would receive the feedback, he would hear the criticism, and he would take some time to reflect and learn. So at the beginning of this month, uh, November 4th, I think, he posted an r slash horror lit. That's the post that I, I read part of at the very beginning of this video. I don't know how long this video is going to be. <laughs> um, but I want to read some more of it because he goes on to reflect. On the book's controversy. I've read the reviews. I've read the re aggressive emails. Half the people who read the book love it and the other half hate it and it just keeps on selling. It sells 10 times more per day than my next most popular work. It usually lingers in the top 20 US horror on Amazon, and its popularity garners some really negative attention from people who believe that emailing me messages saying you should kill yourself or telling me I am a racist ghoul are good works in the name of social justice. I've had people tell me that the way I wrote Faye's character proves that I am an incel who's never been outside. Mention of the book causes arguments on social media that occasionally turn inappropriate. I have received messages threatening my family. I have also received hate mail from conservative readers who call me a woke lord and a cuck and other names I can't even mention here just for drawing attention to indigenous topics in fiction. I once gave a, deme a demanding reader proof that I donate some of my royalties to an indigenous nonprofit whose mission I care a lot about and that reader turned around and said I was a white, a white savior. To be sure, there are plenty of mild-mannered and legitimate critiques of the book and that is a great thing. That's the stuff that inspired me to do better on the prequel. So obviously I don't approve of messages like this being sent to an author. I don't think anyone should kill themselves because of a book that they wrote. Let's keep reading. On my actual thought process writing the characters in this story. As a person with an expensive chronic illness, living in one of the most expensive places in the US, unable to move away because of my dying father, I am financially dependent on this novel. This financial need makes me feel obligated to defend it defend it, whereas my evolving skills as a writer and perception of the landscape of social justice makes me want to distance myself from it. I freely admitted from the outset that this book is not very good, except for its antagonist, who I think is a clever addition to the world of horror lit. The characters are clearly written by a novice, all of them. My overuse of words like suddenly and the total lack of pacing betray the inexperience I had as a writer back then. The essay in the back of the book is well-intentioned, but obviously flawed. In what ways? Can you, can you talk about what ways the essay is flawed? Because I would really appreciate to know what level of reflection has happened on the thoughts there and, and how your thoughts have changed. I wanted to include native characters in my story for a few reasons. One of my best friends is Tongva, and our relationship was largely built on discussions about our childhoods. I grew up as a white kid in Colorado, where native histories are packaged and sold to whites like me as a mystical, pop-cultural aspect of Coloradian identity. I recall making a bunch of native arts and crafts in class one day in elementary school, which would be perceived as wildly inappropriate today for a bunch of white students to do under the tutelage of a white teacher. In college, where I met this friend, I was memorably affected by how different the truth of indigenous histories were from what had been taught and sold to me as a kid. So I wanted my native characters to talk about that in the book, and they did. Not well, but they did. I mentioned in the essay that I wanted to stir up discussion about natives in fiction, and boy howdy have I accomplished that at least. But as I've learned, there are tons of competing perspectives on how natives and any characters of minority status should be portrayed in fiction. Some people told me that the native characters should never be killed because that indicates they have no value. Some people told me that they should have used Indian magic to defeat the monster. Some people told me that no white author should ever write characters with whom they do not share an ethnic or cultural background. And I've seen all of these groups argue with each other. Round and round they go and the book keeps getting picked up by reviewers. So. The three arguments he has chosen to highlight here, to me, are all extreme and besides the point. 
I wouldn't say that native characters should never be killed. I would say that um, if the only characters getting killed and brutally mutilated are native, maybe you should reevaluate that. I wouldn't say that they should have used Indian magic to defeat the monster, but I would question why your story needs to have an indigenous monster at its center if it is not a story about an indigenous community and the themes do not revolve around that community and that culture. And I wouldn't say that no white author should ever write characters with whom they do not share an ethnic or cultural background. I would just say that um, you need to do the work to do it well. And that even when doing it well, there are some um, topics and ideas and, and stories that just aren't yours to tell. It's not your job to be a cultural educator. So these arguments feel beside the point and cheap to me. They're, they're the extremes. In the end, I do stand by many of the decisions I made, but not because I want to be edgy or defiant. I really do just have an apparently unique position on some topics of social justice. If I had written two Irish Catholic characters instead of two Native ones, there would never have been any controversy over their participation in the attempted exorcism of a demonic entity. That's because exorcism is a Catholic... <laughs> My native characters did say a few prayers that actually worked, and they did share what little knowledge they had on the monster. They also died trying to help people they did not know, but they didn't do these things because they were mystical shamans or powerful wise men. They did it because they were good dudes. That's it. And I think good dudes of any culture would have done the same. For the people that imagined I was acting maliciously for killing them, I have only this to offer. If you read all of my novels, my personal favorite characters always get killed. I totally get that it's not a good look for two native characters to die in a book where the two ostensibly white characters survive, but I just honestly wasn't thinking about skin color when I killed them. I was thinking of which characters would affect the reader most to lose. I do apologize for making anyone feel otherwise. I didn't think the author was acting maliciously. I just thought it was very uninformed and a really bad look to do so, but I didn't think it was malicious. That's not my issue. There's a paragraph on Faye's character, but I haven't really talked about her. Um, apparently some reviewers took issue with how she was written, but I'm just going to skip over that paragraph. How I have improved my craft through the reception of stolen tongues. After the dust settled from stolen tongues, I was plagued with the thought, what should I do now? Should I unpublish the novel, rewrite it entirely so it pisses fewer people off, and then republish it? If I do that, should I discard the natives altogether? After all, they aren't very central to the plot. This story could have taken place in Norway. Should I have written it in third person to free me up to kill the main character or Faye? Should I have written it from a woman's perspective? Should I take the good parts, the imposter, and write an entirely different story? Writing teachers told me to fix it. Authors told me to stand by my work. Readers told me to be ashamed of it. My tax guy told me to keep writing the exact same thing and F the haters. Ultimately, I decided I just wanted to grow. I don't really appreciate the trivializing of, um, should I rewrite the novel so it pisses fewer people off? <laughs> I understand it sounds like people were pissed off, but it feels like it's trivializing that um, by only providing examples of really extreme um, comments that he's gotten and extreme arguments. He hasn't actually, if you notice that he hasn't actually presented the like balanced critiques. It's given a lot of examples of extreme ones, which I imagine would stick in your mind as a, a writer and as a person on a public platform. I, I understand why perhaps those would be the ones that would be hardest to kind of move past, but it wasn't just people needlessly pissed off. There are, are real reasons to be very unhappy with this story, and it's frustrating to see him only engaging with extremes because it, it feels like a straw man. It feels disingenuous to say like, oh, look at all these crazy things people were saying, then of course you as the reader are going to go, oh, weird, you should ignore those things. But <laughs> I know that's not the only critique that was being given. But he says, ultimately, I decided I just wanted to grow. Okay, great. Let's learn about how. It's so hard to just take feedback from readers on books because readers seem to be unaware of how often they really disagree with each other on how certain things should be written, as I've mentioned. But what I learned was I needed to consider all of the feedback, even from the ideas that opposed each other, and make decisions about how I wanted to approach, approach the subject matter I wanted to write. Indigenous histories are very dear to me, and I've spent many years of my life doing two degrees because of them. So I was not going to take the don't ever write non-white characters advice I got from the most puritanical readers. Instead, I wrote a prequel to Stolen Tongues called The Church Beneath the Roots, and it has a lot of what I consider to be improvements. So I think it's worth saying here that uh, ideally when you're publishing a book, the, the feedback stage happens before you publish it because reviews aren't for you to grow as an author. 
I think we've seen a lot in the last few years. Well, not just in the last few years, but it seems to be becoming more common in the last few years of readers entering reviewer spaces and harassing reviewers, arguing with reviewers, commenting on reviews, and it, it, it's very uncomfortable for reviewers because reviews are for readers looking for recommendations of books to read or to avoid based on their particular interests. And so um, reader uh, reviews do not exist for the sake of the author. The unorthodox nature of this book's publishing means that it couldn't go through the proper review process. And I understand that there were economic limitations um, in regards to hiring an editor or sensitivity readers, but it doesn't change the fact that that feedback stage should have happened before it was ever published. And the feedback that was received was from colleagues who encouraged him not to publish it. So that's something worth saying off the bat. But again, I also, I, this this feels a bit disingenuous to me because um, it's talking about how often readers disagree with things on how certain things should be written, and I'm sure that's true, I'm sure that's the case, but none of that has any bearing on the actual communities in question, such as the tribes of Colorado, native communities in general, but especially those of Colorado. Those are the the... That's the feedback you should care most about. So The Church Beneath the Roots, which is the prequel that was released earlier this year, apparently has improvements, and he's listed them in bullet points. So let's go through them. I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to read through them all and then respond. I forgot to give a little bit of context for this prequel. So the premise is, is that it is about the tribe that Tiwe and Nathan are a part of. I still don't know the tribe's name, but they're on the Cold Valley Indian Reservation in Colorado, which is fictional. I'm not sure if there's ever been like a map released about like where that reservation would be located. But again, I just wanted to give that context because we're still dealing with the issue of a made up reservation and a made up tribe and a made up community. And I talk more about like fictitious tribes at the end of this video. I think there is a nuanced conversation to be had there, but I don't think that this author should be creating fictional tribes with fictional histories. So that's just a little bit of background before we go into the the um, supposed improvements that the author made. The story is told from a native character's perspective, informed by three years of research on life on Indian reservations in 1960s Colorado. These included trips to UCLA's libraries, interviews with people who grew up on reservations, as well as consultations with experts on my particular subject of interest, federal and church political influence in Indian affairs on reservations after the Indian New Deal. Indigeneity as an identity and a theme serves as the foundation for the plot rather than just being a spice added onto an irrelevant plot. Specifically, indigenous identity in motion, during a time when many natives were abandoning their old spiritual traditions and adopting Christianity. Are Christian Indians traitors to their people, cultures, histories? This book was sensitivity read by a dozen readers of different backgrounds, some of them indigenous, and their feedback was implemented into the final manuscript. The distribution of deaths by ethnicity is far better balanced, and the deaths are all plot relevant and meaningful on multiple levels. The most layered character is a little old lady with an extraordinarily painful story. The ending is a banger. <laughs> uh, let's just let's start with the beginning. So the story is told from a native character's perspective, informed by three years of research on, uh, on life on Indian reservations in 1960s Colorado. So I would be curious to learn more about this research. Um, did the people you were consulting with know you were consulting with them to write a novel? Um, what specifically, uh, he talks about um, trips to UCLA's libraries, interviews, um, I'd be curious if those were interviews with people who grew up on Colorado's reservations or just reservations in general because regionally um, the BIA functions very differently from region to region and treaty rights are different from region to region, historical context is different from region to region, uh, geography and traditional ecological knowledge are different from region to region, so I'd be curious to know if they were um, Colorado, uh, uh, people who grew up on reservations in Colorado. Um, and then consultations with experts on my particular subject of interest, federal and church political influence in Indian affairs on reservations after the Indian New Deal. I'd be curious who those experts were, were they native scholars, were they non-native scholars? But also, I mean, three years of research sounds impressive, but on life on Indian reservations in 1960s Colorado, that's very specific. And I'm... <laughs> I'm not actually convinced that three years is enough time. So bullet point one, number one, mostly just raises questions for me. I think it's written in a way that sounds impressive, like, oh, this guy has done a lot of research, 
but um, I have questions about the methodology and the sources and, and all of that. Bullet point two is where he fully lost me. I'll read it again. Uh, indigeneity as an identity and a theme serves as the foundation for the plot rather than just being a spice added onto an irrelevant plot. Specifically, indigenous identity in motion during a time when many natives were abandoning their old spiritual traditions and adopting Christianity. Are Christian Indians traitors to their people slash cultures slash histories? This is not his story to write. Um, I am glad he's interested in indigenous histories, as he said. He says, indigenous histories are very dear to me. I'm glad. Um, I'm glad he cares about indigenous communities and wants to know more. Wanting to know more and learning more does not authorize you to write a book that you then reap profit from. And it is hard for me to even put into words how very much so this is not his story to write. Reading the, the last sentence of that bullet point, the question, are Christian Indians traitors to their people slash cultures slash histories? That just hit me like a punch to the gut the first time I read it. Because this isn't a question for your intellectual curiosity. And I don't know why he's decided that this is the story he gets to write, that he has a right to author, and that he, from his three years of research, can understand the immense weight of that question. Also just a little bit baffled by I mean, some of the most common writing advice that's given for how do you write characters who do not share your cultural background, right? Whether that is a national background, an ethnic background, a religious background, all of the above, etc. How do you write a character like that? And the answer that gets given a lot, that I've seen given a lot, is you can write those characters, but you can't write their stories, right? That like, they can be a part of the story that you're telling, handle their stories with care, and ideally consult sensitivity readers, um, interview with people who have that experience. But at the end of the day, their story is not yours to tell. So like, I would never write a book about the black experience in America. That doesn't mean I can't ever write a black character, right? If I if I do so with care, but it's not my place to write about the the lived experience of being a black individual in America. That's not that's not my story to tell. Indigeneity as an identity and a theme, specifically the Christian Christianity coming to native communities and whether that makes people traitors to their people, cultures and histories. This is so not a topic that should be handled by a non-native author. It, it just, it, <laughs> in, in no world should this be the story that he's decided to tell. And I, I, I truly find myself at a loss for words because I, I don't, I, this seems obvious to me. I, <laughs> so I think I'm, I'm gonna move on to the next bullet point because I don't even, so yeah, let, let's move on. The, the book was sensitivity read by a dozen readers of different backgrounds, some of them indigenous, and their feedback was implemented into the final manuscript. I wonder how many of the dozen, although maybe um, maybe it felt weird to him to write a specific number. I would also wonder uh, their tribal affiliation, their um, background. For example, even though this is a theme that's very close to my heart, I wouldn't be the right sensitivity reader for a story like this because I am not from Colorado, my tribe is not in Colorado, and I also grew up off reservation, so I can't really speak to the experience of growing up on the reservation, much less the reservation in the 1960s, which obviously narrows the pool a lot, but if you're looking for sensitivity readers who can actually um, really carefully assess what you've written, I would hope it goes beyond just them identifying as indigenous. Um, the distribution of deaths by ethnicity is far better balanced and their deaths are all plot relevant and meaningful. There's a little old lady with an extraordinarily painful story, etc. So I am mind boggled that these are the improvements. Again, I think having an interest in indigenous histories, having an interest in um, different tribal movements and different eras of federal Indian policy and how that affected tribal life and life on reservations, that's great. I think people being interested in tribes, like truly interested in their lived experiences, not just their like aesthetic, um, that's a, a good thing. I would absolutely encourage that. But again, that, that doesn't give you license to write a book about that where you position yourself as some kind of authority on these questions of identity. Let's finish the Reddit post. 
Not surprisingly, the book got a lot of not as scary as Stolen Tongues and too much history reviews. I really wrote this book for Stolen Tongues critics, and that's something I don't think I'll ever do again, but I'm damn proud of the growth I've experienced in writing this book. Stolen Tongues is a snapshot of who I was a, as a young writer, with all of my flaws and imperfections exposed to the world, and its prequel is the evidence that I have improved. But it's very hard for me to even think about the series because of all the mixed feelings it conjures. I'm so proud that I, a literal nobody, accidentally wrote a best-selling horror novel that made my meager dreams affordable and caused extensive debate on the internet. But I'm also ashamed that I was not a better writer at the time. The book was released right at the outset of several convening moments, movements in social justice, and had I known that fact, and had I known it had been a big seller, I'd have taken a lot more care in its construction. But therein lies a big mystery. If I had written the book any differently, would it have been the success it was? Anyways, the internet does a lot of great things for us as humans, but it also separates us in such a way that we think we know more about other people's motives than we really do. When I wrote Stolen Tongues, I absolutely did not set out to harm some indigenous community or add to the pile of books that missed the mark on writing women. I certainly wasn't trying to put indigenous horror authors out of business. All of my sub stories were published for free consumption right here on Reddit. All I wanted to do was scare people and make people think. So I do apologize for the people who feel let down by the book, and I'm very grateful for all your feedback, brutal as some of it might be. Again, I I don't I don't assume anything about the author's motives. If anything, I assume that his intentions were good and that he truly does care on some level about Native communities and included them because he thought he was doing a good thing. But I don't at all see him <laughs> reckoning with the bad. He did. I see him acknowledging bad writing choices. The specific thing he mentioned was killing the two Native characters off. That's the only thing he acknowledged was bad optically for the book. Uh, but none of these other things that we've been talking about. And the supposed improvements for the prequel that he's listed indicate to me that it might be worse. I haven't read it. I don't really plan to, honestly. I think it might make me more angry than anything, and I, I, I don't know that I want to put myself through that experience. But those supposed improvements indicate to me a lack of reflection on a lot of the actual feedback that was being given about the Native representation. Um, someone left a comment on this Reddit post saying, Stolen Tongues is such an apt title for what you've done here and what you're continuing to do. While the Reddit community may have your back and support, yeah, people were largely positive about this post, very supportive of it. I strongly object to a white author centering two Native characters in the way that you've had. I've read the reaction from members of the Native community and I'm surprised that after everything they talked about you were proceeding to write a sequel. I find that middle chunk to be phrased strange. I strongly object to a white author centering two Native characters in the way that you have. Um, I don't really know what the person was trying to get at with that comment. But the author, Felix Blackwell, responded, this is a good example of the sort of disagreements the critics have among themselves. There are people who think white authors should never ever write native characters. There are people who think they can and it just needs to be done with care. And there are people who think authors should be able to write characters, with, characters of any ethnicity with any level of creative freedom. As a writer, it's not possible to please all three groups. I'm not sure if you read the book, but the native tribes from which these characters come are entirely fictional. They are a pastiche of various cultures of the Great Plains and Southwest divisions of indigenous peoples. This is, sorry. I'm getting <laughs> tired of this. This is the same thing we do in fantasy with dwarves, elves, fictional races of humans. They are all informed by real cultures. The reaction from native readers in my experience has been decidedly mixed, which is representative of the broader reception of these characters. But yes, I do not agree with readers who say white authors should only write white characters or they have to follow a set of rules in horror, like don't kill a BIPOC character, don't cast them as antagonists, etc. I find these takes to be rather puritanical, and I don't think it advances the best interest of real BIPOC people to treat them as a separate group with separate rules on their portrayal. I understand that this is a controversial position, but it is my honest position. I do listen to their advice, and I invited it on the construction of the prequel, not sequel, there is no such thing. And as I mentioned before, their advice was not unanimous. It conflicted. There is no uniform Native opinion on this subject. For what it's worth, I do think it is morally better for me to just keep writing the characters I want to write, but try to improve with each project, rather than throwing my hands in the air and writing books that only include white characters. So I, uh, the first paragraph that talks about the three camps of people who think white, author, white authors should never ever write native characters, um, they can, it just needs to be done with care, or authors should be able to write characters of any ethnicity with any level of creative freedom. Now to be clear, authors have the right to write whatever they want. And that is the the beauty of creative freedom, is you can write whatever you want. But if you write things poorly, you are going to be told so, especially if something gets this popular. 
So I would fall into the second camp. My, my perspective, I would fall into the second camp with the caveat. There, there are people who think authors can't, white authors can write native characters. It just needs to be done with care. And I would add the caveat. I think I phrased this a little poorly. So let me voice over myself here for a second. Native stories, stories about our histories, cultures, struggles, resilience, are not for non-natives to tell. Uh, because of the long history of colonialism, suppression and forced assimilation, extractivism and exploitation, native stories and knowledge systems are not some neutral playground for intellectual curiosity. Native characters must be handled with care, yes, and part of that care is acknowledging that there are certain stories you shouldn't be positioning yourself as the authority on. There are many stories you can tell that include native characters without stepping over this line, which is why I find the kind of, I either write this story or I throw my hands up and stop writing dichotomy presented here disingenuous. The second paragraph is so much to unpack. I'm not sure if you've read the book, but the native tribes from which these characters come are entirely fictional. They are a pastiche of various cultures of the Great Plains and Southwest divisions of indigenous peoples. This is the same thing we do in fantasy with dwarves, elves, fictional races of humans. They are all informed by real cultures. Tribes are not dwarves or elves. This actually broke my brain on some fundamental level. Then the last section, I don't even want to talk a lot about a lot of it because it feels like a straw man again, like picking the most extreme, um, extreme thing you've ever been told and acting like that's the dominant opinion of your critics, which from what I saw in critical reviews was not the case. I actually didn't see a single critical review saying, white authors should never write native characters. Maybe they exist somewhere, maybe they were all privately emailed to him, but I didn't see a single critical review saying that. Um, so acting like it is the dominant critique he's received, in my opinion, is disingenuous. But also there's this note about, I don't think it advances the best interest of real BIPOC people to treat them as a separate group with separate rules on their portrayal. Um, I wouldn't say separate rules, but the fact is, is that those people have different lived experiences. And so if you want to actually write them, you have to be true to their lived experiences. I wouldn't say there's like separate rules for portraying Native Americans, but if you're portraying Native Americans, you have to portray them in a way that is true to reality. There is an article I was reading on the Native Appropriations blog about Tonto actually in the, the newer version of The Lone Ranger. Johnny Depp played Tonto and it was um, truly a terrible depiction of, of a Native character. But this article had a quote that I think is exactly what I'm trying to articulate here. So I'll, I'll wrap up this section with this quote and I'll link the, um, the article below. How can we expect mainstream support for sovereignty, self-determination, nation building, tribally controlled education, healthcare, and jobs when 90% of Americans only view Native people as one-dimensional stereotypes situated in the historic past, or even worse, situated in their imaginations. I argue that we can't, and that to me is why Tonto matters. So on that note, I want to transition into a slightly broader discussion, and I think a more lighthearted one too. I'm also going to plug a few resources for finding Native authors, in Native stories because if you're interested in the Native American experience, the best place to learn about it is from authors who've lived that experience and are prepared to write about those themes in a way that honors their communities and their histories and their cultures. Um, but on a, a broader note, I wanted to talk about fictionalized Native tribes. This quote that I just read has that note about um, uh, Americans perceiving Native people as being situated in their imaginations. And I was curious about what other readers, and especially Native uh, readers and writers, think about fictionalized Native tribes. So what I mean by this is, um, I guess fictitious might be the better word, but a made-up Native tribe. And um, I found an interesting kind of mixed opinion online, and so I wanted to share some of my thoughts and some of the thoughts I found, and um, just talk about that like on a, on a broad level. <laughs> My personal take is that I think there are very few circumstances in which it's appropriate to make up a native tribe for the sake of telling a story. And the reason is for reasons I've already given in this video, so I don't want to belabor them. But the reality is, is that um, every region of this country was touched by native peoples in some ways. And there are these unique histories and relationships to the land. And then as settlement and colonization occurred, there are these unique histories that came out of that contact. And there's, there's treaty histories, there's reservation histories. Um, and 
to me, it's hard to imagine being able to create a fictitious tribe that doesn't somehow step on that existing history and erase it on some level or overwrite it on some level. And a part of why this is my opinion is just because I've seen it done poorly. Um, <laughs> Supernatural actually did this, I think twice it made up tribes. And it was so interesting because the first time it happened, they were going to a tribe in the mountains of Colorado. Colorado again, hmm, what's happening in Colorado? <laughs> um, they were going to a tribe in the mountains of Colorado and I was like, oh, it must be like the Ute Mountain tribe because the, the Utes were, were in the mountains. And that's where, I mean, it doesn't really match up because the reservations are further south, but, and then they get there, of course, and it, I don't even, I can't remember if the tribe is ever named, but it's, it's a made up tribe. And this is, of course, the episode when Metatron gets introduced. Metatron, the angel who sounds like he should be a transformer. Wouldn't it be so funny if it was just like a semi truck? <laughs> <laughs> to transform. Never mind. <laughs> I'm getting loopy. So that was, I mean, off-putting. And then, of course, I mean, Supernatural has a terrible history with Native representation, with decontextualizing Native creatures from the cultures that they come from, the context that they come from, creating Halloween monsters out of Native teachings, making up tribes, having cursed Indian burial grounds. Just, I mean, anything you you want, you will find. Oh, there's like a cannibal episode, too. Um, so, yeah, not... Not a great history there, but that happened and I remember just feeling really like, oh man, I thought they were actually gonna engage with like a real tribe on some level at least, or like acknowledge the existence of a real tribe and well, they just may going up in the mountains. And then obviously this book, I, I think did a, a poor job of engaging realistically with Colorado's history and um, presents, like I said, like an alternate history for the state of Colorado, which I think is inappropriate and irresponsible. And I think, again, you're, you're not creating a, a fantasy story and a fantasy civilization. I, I, to me, it's kind of like creating like a new state. Like if you're writing a story in the US and you didn't want to be faithful to any particular state, so you just make your own, you can do that, but where is the state? Because wherever you put it, it is going to affect the course of US history. How did that state get founded? How did the states around it get founded? Founded? How did the, the changing land history affect the, the demographics of the community and the political history and like the, the economics and all of that? Like it raises all these questions about like n now you are writing an alternate US history, right? And so if that's what you wanna do, do it. It could be like a fun thought exercise, but you're not representing anybody because you're, you're making up an alternate history. And that's how I feel about making up a fake tribe is, is you can do that, but it affects everything around it. And now you're writing an alternate history and you're not actually representing a native community. Now, the, the pushback I found to this online that I think is interesting is that uh, it can be a good direction to go if you are concerned about representing a specific tribe in a specific way or like putting a spotlight on a tribe in a way that could be harmful to it. So Nick Medina is a native author, he's Tunica Biloxi, and he wrote a novel called Sisters of the Lost Nation. And he made up a tribe for the sake of writing this story. And he said it's, so that the book is about the missing and murdered indigenous women and girls epidemic. And he said he didn't want to saddle any one tribe with the events that take place in the book. So to me, I haven't read that book, so I can't speak to how it's executed. I know it's been, it's been very well received in native reader circles, but that's a decision that comes out of sensitivity to communities rather than a fear of misrepresenting or not getting things right. I think if you're, I think if you're unsure of your ability to represent a community while you probably shouldn't be writing stories centered around that community, that feels like a no brainer to me. Um, but so that's an example where I could see that um, making a, a fictionalized tribe that is based on specific historic contexts could be appropriate. But I think in general, I, I would lean towards it not being appropriate to make up native tribes to tell stories about native experiences. And that's just kind of the open-ended note I wanted to leave on. Um, that's a conversation that I think does have more nuance and I'm kind of interested in other people's thoughts. And finally, we have reached, we have reached the end. I feel free. I feel unburdened. Wow. I just want to drop some recommendations here. The first few recommendations I want to make are indigenous horror authors. 
I think I mentioned earlier, horror is not really my genre. I don't have a lot of reading experience in this realm. These are names I see get mentioned a lot though. The first is Stephen Graham Jones. He's a Blackfeet author. His books are wildly popular in native circles. Um, he has The Only Good Indians, My Heart is a Chainsaw, I Was a Teenage Slasher, The Angel of Indian Lake, Don't Fear the Reaper. These like titans of books that I have seen recommended everywhere. I'd really like to read at least The Only Good Indians. Um, but I've heard great things about his work. And then Jessica Johns wrote Bad Cree. She is from Canada. She's Cree. I had it in my notes to mention Never Whistle at Night, and I don't know why I didn't, except that it was late at this point and I was very tired. <laughs> but Never Whistle at Night is uh, an anthology of indigenous horror, and it's like over two dozen authors. And if you look at the author list, it's just like powerhouse after powerhouse. And I have heard such good things about this book. I am really eager to get my hands on it and read it. Um, but this is another one that uh, is, is highly recommended. It was published near the end of 2023. There are also so many native authors and so many good books. My TBR grows every day. I will never catch up to it. There's an account on Instagram. I'll, I'll put it up on the screen right now. She's the author of Blood Sisters. I believe she's a Cherokee author. And for Native American Heritage Month, she's been doing native author recommendations every day. So it's a great resource to check if you want a bunch of book recommendations. There are also multiple native book clubs online, one of which is run by Bojo Books on Bindery, which is an indigenous imprint with Bindery. And so you can actually, I mean, there's a free tier and you can see the book recommendations and see what the club is currently reading at the time but you can also join the bindery and um, get your name and a little thank you on the imprint and get early copies of whatever books get published that's really cool as well i hope as we come to the end of this native american heritage month that if you are interested in native stories which if you've made it this far i have to assume you are <laughs> i don't know why you'd be here if you're not i hope you uh, pick up a new book by a native author there are truly so, so many good books written by Native authors. I despair of the fact that I probably will not read, get to read all of the ones I want to in my lifetime. Um, and if you are reading or have recently read a Native authored book, drop it in my comments, let me know what it is. I recently read The Service Berry by Robin Wall Kimmerer. It's her most recent book. So good, so many great reflections on gift economies and our relationship with the natural world and she just always gives me so much to think about. And the next one I'm hoping to pick up is Thinning Blood by Leah Meyer. Um, but yeah, drop, drop your recommendations in my comments. Maybe there will be ones I haven't heard of. Um, I also just invite you to uh, share your thoughts on anything I've talked about in this video. Like I said, I, I don't represent anyone but myself in my own perspectives, and I acknowledge that um, I can absolutely be wrong about things or, or not consider certain other perspectives and my opinions on these things. And so I would love to hear your thoughts if you've made it this far, whether you're native or not native, reader or writer. And um, yeah, I hope you have a great rest of your November. I guess we'll see when this gets posted. Maybe it will already be December, in which case I hope you had a great rest of your December. Thank you for joining me and I'll see you in the new year. I'm, I'm lugging off. <laughs> Bye.